Three days and three videos in this shirt. I'm starting to feel like six feet under. Yeah, there's another Graveyard Classics album. It's the first I think we're actually talking about, but we have to talk about it. Graveyard Classics 4, The Number of the Priest. Catchy title. So we're talking about just two bands. There's only two bands on the docket for this one. Iron Maiden and Judas Priest, two of the most classic heavy metal bands of all time. And we've got five tracks from Judas Priest, six from Iron Maiden, handpicked by the CEO of Metal Blade Records. Thanks, Brian, because we really, really needed this. This was exactly what we wanted for Christmas. And look at the calendar, it's not even June. Holy horseshit, this guy's a giver. So, this is the fourth time that Six Feet Under has opted to do covers of classic songs. And the first three, while they've been a bit tedious, it, they've gotten a bit of a lukewarm reception. Some of the versions have been seen as pretty cool, while most of them have been seen as really chores to listen to. We definitely need to see what happens with this one here. But if it's anything like the first taste that we got of this album, which was Invader, it's a Judas Priest cover, uh, then this one may actually fall under that same category, that same chore category, that catachory. That was awful. Awful like that terrible cover of Painkiller by Death. No, it actually is pretty awesome. But yes, yeah, Six Feet Under somehow was able to do the one thing that you didn't think was possible whenever you listen to Judas Priest or Iron Maiden. Both of these songs, or should I say both of these bands, have this sort of charisma to them, this kinesis to them, that makes it sound like any band could potentially cover this stuff in a style, whatever it may be. It could be polka, for Christ's sake, and somehow, some way. It could be made to sound good, considering all of the energy that you feel whenever you listen to these songs. Now, these may not be the classic hits, you might not be getting the number of the beasts, but it's still one where these bands present so much energy, so much, so much motion, that you would think that this should be a pretty easy chore for Six Feet Under to actually accomplish, but yet somehow, some way, they were able to make this into a bona fide mess. Now, for the record, the band itself is really attempting to do some pretty good work here, and for the record, three quarters of the band does okay work. Uh, these are songs that are not necessarily very difficult to learn if you're on the heavy metal radar and you're proficient with your instruments. I'm not stating that I could just walk up to a guitar and all of a sudden play Nightcrawler with my cock, but if I could, you can bet your ass that I would, because that'd be pretty neat. Just can't put that shit on YouTube. Thanks a lot, content protection. But at any rate, Nightcrawler starts this one off, and immediately you can kind of tell where the chore part of this sentiment really comes in. And that's in Chris Barnes' vocals. The vocals are really the tantamount problem that you see exhibited on this album. Death metal is something where, I understand, there's a lot of glut, there's a lot of oral that happens with a lot of this stuff, and Chris Barnes is certainly one of the kings of glutteral. He's one of the kings of that raspy, I've been smoking for 75 generations sound to his overall gruff voice and his vocal delivery is certainly one that matches that 100%. But whenever you have Iron Maiden and Judas Priest, which both have air raid siren vocalists with large dynamic ranges, it tends to muddy the waters a little bit. It tends to actually just piss in the pool, considering all that stagnation that you get based off of something that's very centralized within one region of the vocal universe tends to give these songs a lot less of the punch than the originals actually are able to accomplish. And every so often, whenever Chris decides to bellow out some random noise that I can only assume is an attempt to either emanate Rob Halford or emanate Bruce Dickinson or just because maybe he had something in his throat, it only makes it a little bit more difficult to sort of soldier your way through this. For the record, Nightcrawler was done, it was handled alright, I guess. This was one of those latter era tracks, it's from Painkiller from 1990, sort of around the same generation that, you know, they were trying to resurrect with their last album, Six Feet Under, that is. You know, that album last year. Woo hoo! What a stinker that motherfucker was. But it's one that also becomes extremely tedious once again with that delivery. Starbreaker and Genocide follow along the same uh, real principle, and then whenever you get to Never Satisfied, the whole entire thing takes a glorified shit. This is a track that actually sounds like instead of the band going into the rehearsal room and rehearsing the song, they just decided to, you know, smoke a bunch of pot and do nothing. Maybe, you know, catch up on Game of Thrones or something else. This is one that just doesn't sound like it had any sort of punch, any sort of zest, almost like it was thrown in at the last second considering the deadline was rapidly approaching. Kind of like a college kid that decides to get drunk, you know, seven hours before his term paper is, uh, is due, and he hasn't done a damn thing on it. Stupid kid. 
By the way, everybody who's graduated, congratulations. The real world sucks. Get used to it. But this is a track that was handled way more expertly by Armored Saint on their Greatest Hits record. This is one that they actually uh, accelerated the track just by a little bit, not by very, very much. And it gave it a lot more punch. It gave it a lot more livelihood. More livelihood than, you know, Rob Halford and Judas Priest's version? Well, that's pretty debatable. But this is one that actually sounds like it's slowed down. There's a bit of a crawl. It's almost like they needed to do that in order to accommodate Barnes a little bit. But in reality, the track listing, you know, the time is right around normal. It's a bit of a paradox, and believe me, this is one that's just as big of a train wreck as I'm kind of illuminating it to be by being completely confused. This is a track that's so bad, I couldn't make it through it. And that should be an indicator of, you know, things to come. That's the end of the Judas Priest half. Let's take a look at the Iron Maiden half, because there's something potentially better on here. If Murders in the Rue Morgue is any, you know, indicator of that, then hell no. Uh, unfortunately not. The band is doing their best, and to be perfectly honest, aside from Never Satisfied, the band's pretty tight. They do a pretty good job with this. It's something where, I guess, these are tracks that uh, you could screw up if you really wanted to, but they just didn't really want to. They actually put it forth at least a B-plus effort, and you know somehow are able to sell it off as a C-plus effort. Try to figure that out. But whenever you get the Prowler, uh, and you just start to realize that perhaps this just isn't their bag. Perhaps this is a style that they just really can't handle with a certain element of proficiency. It's one that just feels like it's sort of been rushed together. Considering their last album came out last year, they've had a year to think about this and do this and learn this and record this. There's been plenty of time. And they don't have to write the music. It's already been written. You just have to learn it and perform it. But once again, like I said, the band's doing an alright job. Barnes is the problem. The problem is is that his vocal range, as I stated before, is something that just doesn't work with vocalists that have such a dynamic, dynamic, diverse uh, vocal ability. Now I understand that with a covers culture, you're putting it in your own style. So you're not attempting to be Rob Halford, you're not attempting to be Bruce Dickinson whatsoever. And I understand that. Remember, I'm the guy that, you know, examined all those crappy Punk Ghost Whatever albums. Yeah, those were a real short too. This is starting to actually become a real common thing. But this is something where even that has a little bit more kinesis to it. There are some things that death metal just perhaps needs a little bit more of the, uh, of the wider expanding uh, notion to the death metal universe in order to give it that livelihood. Either that, or if you really want to do this, then not really have the reflecting music in the background kind of satisfy a little bit more, or be a little bit more closely, to the new wave of British heavy metal that was actually provided by the originals. Actually, you know, kind of pervert this into the death metal style a little bit, you know, give it a little bit of that oomph, give it a little bit of that, you know, destructive variety. Make it sound like he actually wants to kill people. Flash of the Blade is perhaps the one track where Chris Barnes is able to deliver a bit of a gem. And by a bit of a gem, I mean he tried his best, but you know, there's only so much that you can do. For the record, this is the one that probably sounds the best out of the bunch. And it's one that's handled by the fact that not only is Flash of the Blade just an incredibly catchy and really good song, it's also based around the fact that this is pretty well executed by the band surrounding him. He does his best in order to really keep his vocals in check. And for the record, this is also one that, you know, as far as the verses are concerned, Bruce doesn't do a lot of kinesis. There's not a lot of motion to his vocals, at least not by comparison to some of the other tracks from the classic 1980s era. So this is one that actually feels like it was in his wheelhouse until the absolute chorus. Until we actually got to the part of the song that, you know, really gives it and delivers it that punch. That's whenever things turn to shit. And then you still have the evil that men do, Stranger in a Strange Land, and Total Eclipse. This is a chore. This is a bore. Somehow, some way, they have turned Judas Priest and Iron Maiden boring. I would give this album a score, but I am scared that it would be subterranean. I would give this album a, a number, but I'm scared that it would be a joke. Giving it a 42 out of 100 is an insult to the number 42. This is more like a 35. This is more like a negative 35. Somehow, some way, with part of the work being done for you, this sucks balls. This is awful. Out of all the Graveyard Classic albums, and believe me, I've tortured myself with all of them, this is the worst of the four. And this is the one that had a gimmick. The other three at least had at least one or two songs that were able to accompany the style, and really, Chris was able to do something with it that at least made it passable. 
but this here, it just feels like a mess. It feels like Chris was trying to do, well, honestly, not enough. There is more that he probably should have tried to do with this. Comes off as a bit lazy. Comes off as a bit hokey. It comes off as a band that had a stunker last year, a stinker or a stunker, maybe a skunker, and is immediately trying to help us forget about it by releasing this. Slap the name Judas Priest, Iron Maiden on it, hopefully people will buy it, and then you give them this shit. Man, it sucks. That last paragraph was tedious. So is this album. I almost don't want to ask this, but what'd you think about it? Let me know in the comments below. I'm Cover Killer Nation, and I'm actually going to get out of this shirt. I feel way too much like six feet under right now, and that ain't no good thing. Bye.